So we know what the, we have two, we have a, a basis, but we want to get an orthogonal basis. So we can pick any values of S and T that are not zero. Uh, I, at least when there's only two vectors, independence is relatively easy to just look at and see, but if we pick an S and a T that are not both zero, I think any, I don't think any combination, any two sets of values will be linearly dependent, just looking at our two vectors. That's a lot harder to see. If I had three vectors that generated our space, three basis vectors, it'd be much harder to look at and just see that any values of ST and whatever other letter you use W would be independent. But I think with these two, it looks like any two will be independent, but let's write out that um, equation and make sure that we're not deep, linearly dependent. All right, so what we wrote down last was that that's the orthogonal equation right there. Now I'm gonna write down the linear independence equation. So we also want linear independence. So we have our two vectors written out right above there. So we'll go with alpha one times the first vector. So it's alpha one times the first vector plus alpha two times our second vector. What should this add up to be if we're looking for independence? Zero. Zero. And wh what zero do we mean? The vector. The vector zero. So the previous one was the number zero. This one is the vector zero, which I'm, we know it's in three dimensions, so I'll just write out proper zero, zero, zero for our three dimensional zero vector. All right, so we have to. So we're trying to pick an S1, T1, <coughs> S2, T2, such that the first property is true and the second property is only true when both of the alphas are zero. So let's just worry about the first equation now. So one thing to notice, there is four unknowns, S1, T1, S2, T2, there's four unknowns and basically one equation. So we have a lot more variables than we have equations. What that means is we're gonna have free variables. So we'll have choice. We'll be able to choose uh, certain values and then whatever we get from this will eliminate some of those choices. But we should have quite a few degrees of freedom or quite a few free variables. I'm thinking at least two, maybe even three free variables right here. Um, and of course we have the restriction, they can't both be zero. Um, so S1 and T1 cannot simultaneously be zero and S2, T2 cannot simultaneously be zero as well because that would give us a zero vector. All right, so let's go ahead and take that dot product that's at the top of the board. So I will, I don't have space here, so I'll just draw an arrow. We'll do all the work down here. All right, so what we're looking at, there's basically two vectors added together in here. So if I call it like vector one plus other vector one dot vector two plus other vector two equals zero, you can distribute this. So v1 plus w1 dot v2 plus v1 dot w, or v1 plus w1 dot W2. What property did I just use? Uh, 
is the property, this is a distributive property. It's the reason we call it a product. So any product is going to distribute cross addition. It distributes both ways. So what I did was I treated the first sum as a single vector and distributed that way. Now what I'm gonna do is distribute the other direction, like this right here. So we're gonna distribute the other direction. Uh, when you're doing regular algebra, you call this foiling, where you're distributing twice. So it's basically everything times every other thing. So we could look at it as these four dot products adding up to be zero. Okay. <clears throat> so that's going to, if I write it in with uh, now V1, I'll use purple or pink. So that's V1, that's W1, V2, W2. So I'm just using the letters for those. So we're going to have T1110 dot V2, which is T2110 plus W1. It's S1 minus 201 dot v2 t2 plus now it's v1 t1 dot w2 which is s2 minus 201 plus W1, so that's S1 minus 201 dot W2, which is S2 minus 201. And this should be equal to the number zero. Okay. So any questions on lining that up? I know it's quite a few variables, but only one equation. All right, so the dot products, we can commute. In this case, all the t's and s's are scalars. So I can bring those two scalars out front and then just multiply by the dot product. So I'll do one of these at a time. So we have t1, t2. The dot product is one times one plus one times one plus zero times zero. So that's our dot product right there. Next dot product, the scalars are S1, T2. We're going to commute that. Times the dot product is negative 2 times 1 plus 0 times 1 plus 1 times 0. So write out the last two dot products now. The same way we just did this. Algebra questions. So we got one equation. Is it linear? Yes. What degree are these terms? How many variables are multiplied here? Two. Two. So this is no longer a linear equation. Every term is actually quadratic. So what that means, I won't be able to put it into a matrix and solve it. So we won't be able to use a matrix on this. 
It's very tempting to let all those be zero, which obviously satisfies this, but doesn't satisfy the linear independence equation. All right, so I say let's just pick some values. I think maybe we'll pick um, So we tried picking basically two of them to be zero before, and we did not get, I think we did that, right? Yeah. So we made some choices here that one of the s's would be zero, and then on the other vector, the t would be zero. And I think we can tell that no matter what I pick for the other variable, I would not get uh, orthogonal. It wasn't messed up because I chose one for t instead of maybe 10. That's not going to change it. That's just going to scale up the first vector. And maybe I choose seven for the other s, but all that's going to do is scale that second vector. So I won't get orthogonal if I insist that uh, both of these are zero. So that's just a little bit of insight. So let's not automatically choose zero for basically one of the two coordinates already. Uh, let's instead choose one. So let's take the first s to be one and then the second t to be one and see what that leads to. I think that's a relatively easy choice that will lead us to something different. And then hopefully we'll be able to compute if s, the first s is one, what should the t, the other t and the other s be. So that's what we're gonna do. And the only reason I can do this is because I know I have way more variables than I have equations. So there's going to be free variables. So again, I'm making this choice. I'll go with t1 is 1. And then the other, s2, will also be 1. So we're going to make that choice. And hopefully, that will reduce down to uh, much easier equations to deal with. So we'll fill in those values. So we've got 2 times 1 times t2 minus 2s1 t2 minus 2s2. Nope. That's just minus 2. And then plus 5s1. Okay. So it looks like we might be able to pick another value. So what's a reasonable value? Let's just pick a value for S1. And let's not choose zero, because we saw zero may lead to some problems. Maybe two without, just thinking of easy number, negative one would have been my next easiest choice, probably. All right, now there should be exactly one choice. It's not a choice, but this should dictate what t2 equals, hopefully. So I'm choosing s1 to be two. So we get two t2 minus 2 times 2t2 two two minus 2 plus 10 equals 0. So we get T2 has to be 4. So any questions about getting that right there? All right, so we have our values. So if we did T, what do we write first? T is first, S is second. So our T1, S1 will be 1, 2. 
and our T2 S2 is 4, 1. So our basis vectors, make sure we write these correctly, it was t times 1, 1, 0, plus s times minus 2, 0, 1. So we're going to check our two basis vectors, make sure they're independent, and just double check orthogonal. They should be orthogonal because of how we created them. but. We did quite a bit of algebra, and any times I use numbers, I get nervous. So I'm not good with numbers, so let's go ahead. We have our B1. It uses our T1 and our S1. So B1 will be negative 3, 1, 2. B2, B T2, 1, 1, 0, plus S2 minus 2, 0, 1. So that's 4, 1, 0, plus 1, minus 2, 0, 1. Two, four, one. All right, so any questions on reconstructing our basis vectors? All right, so the question is, is it, are these orthogonal and is this a basis? So our set is minus three, one, two, two, four, one. All right, you know how to determine orthogonal? How do we do that? Take dot, product. dot product. So that takes 30 seconds or less, and then basis. So are they independent? We already have the right number of same number of vectors as dimensions, so it really comes down to are they linearly independent? So let's check those two things right now. So we dot product and get zero, and they're not multiples. Neither of them are zero, so they are independent. You can set up the independence equation as well, the proper with the alpha one, alpha two. Um, but I think that sentence right there would be sufficient to explain why they're independent. Do you mean they are dependent when they're multiples? Yes. Yeah, so they are not dependent. So 
So next we're going to look at the actual algorithm for doing this. And it's called Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization. <coughs> So we're going to also use orthonormal. So a normal vector is a unit vector. At least I think it is. I don't. Yeah. So a unit vector has magnitude one. And of course that comes from the word uni. So lots of words we have uni, for example, unicycle, one wheel, unitard, one piece, unibrow, one eyebrow, what else, una? Unilateral means one person makes a decision or one side. What about uniform? Uniform. I think that doesn't refer to necessarily each uniform as one piece. I think it's everybody's wearing the same style. I think that's probably a better way to look at uniform, meaning they all have some property that is the same. Um, it's other good uni words. University. University. <laughs> There's only one. Unicorn. Unicorn. There's only one horn. There we go. All right, let's, that's a good one to move on from. All right, so now it's just referring to the magnitude property. So individually, the coordinates most likely won't be one, but the magnitude needs to be one. Uh, all right, so magnitude of a vector v is the square root of its first coordinate, v1 squared, plus its second coordinate squared plus its nth coordinate squared and you square root. So this is uh, how you compute the magnitude. Uh, we saw that if you do a dot product with yourself, you get the magnitude squared. And one is a nice number. It has a property that one squared is one. So. If the magnitude squared is 1, that's the same as the magnitude is 1. So normalizing. A vector is the process of scaling the vector to a unit vector in the same direction to a parallel unit vector. So we're going to take a vector. So any vector v in real space, Rn. Remember, complex space, things get crazy with the, because uh, you can square and get negative. So you need to. Uh, be in real space if you're going to talk about magnitudes and them always being positive and never negative. So we do need to be in real space. We're going to scale V such that the magnitude is 1. So that's what we want to do. For some scalar alpha. So I haven't talked much about uh, properties of magnitude at all, but one of the properties is it splits over scalar multiplication. And when you do split it, you get the magnitude of a number is the absolute value. Because alpha is a scalar, so it comes out as absolute value. And v is a vector, so that's still magnitude. So if we assume alpha is 
greater than or equal to zero, then absolute value of alpha equals alpha. So if we make that assumption, then absolute value of alpha equals regular alpha. So we're just gonna take alpha to not be negative. Um, what that means is when we think about scaling geometrically is if we're gonna take a small alpha, our scaled vector will be pointing the same direction but be smaller. That's all positive means, whereas negative means it could flip the other direction. So when I say parallel, I mean pointing the same direction. So alpha being uh, zero or more. So now we have alpha times magnitude of V equals one, and we're gonna solve for alpha. So alpha is gonna equal one over the magnitude of V. So all we're gonna do is multiply the vector by the reciprocal of its magnitude, and that will scale it to one. So to, that would give us the unit vector in the direction of V, or parallel to V. And this process is called normalizing. What vector would we have a problem multiplying by one over its magnitude? What kind of vector would this be undefined for? Zero vector. The zero vector. So that's the only vector you cannot normalize is the vector that has magnitude zero or the zero vector. So zero vector cannot be normalized you can take any other vector, vector, however, even if the vector is really small, maybe has a magnitude of one, one millionth, super tiny vector. If it has a tiny magnitude, you just multiply by a million, and then all of a sudden, your magnitude is one. So you can scale a super tiny vector, and if your magnitude was a million already, you just multiply by the reciprocal of that magnitude and scale it back down to a magnitude one. So any vector that has uh, is not zero can be scaled. Another way to think about it, you're basically creating another vector in the same direction. So I just graphed the zero vector. We'll zoom in. What direction is it pointing? That way. It's not really pointing any direction. So how can I create a vector that's pointing no direction that has a magnitude one? So that's another reason why geometrically this wouldn't make any sense. So if you got a vector not pointing a direction, there's no unit vector not pointing a direction. All unit vectors have to point a certain direction. Okay, so that is normalizing. What we're about to get is a orthonormal basis. So it is an orthogonal. basis of unit vectors. Oh. Technical difficulties. So I'll have to rewrite that. Now, personally, I probably would have called it unit orthogonal or I would have put the word uni in there instead of normal, but I wasn't 
around 100 years ago. I almost was, but not quite. Uh, so you'll see the word normal, even though it really means normal is the process of turning things into unit vectors. So it's a little strange, but of course, ortho is for orthogonal. All right, so we have a process for doing this. Uh, we also saw that automatically a orthogonal, a set of orthogonal vectors has to be independent. So we, ch we saw that already. We, pr we proved that. All right, so this is how to convert a basis into an orthogonal, orthonormal basis. So we'll start with our original basis. It'll have n vectors. So we'll just go v1, v2 through vn. And our new basis we'll call b prime and we'll use u's for that. So it'll be u1, u2 to un. So I don't know if I talked in this class about your handwriting for u's and v's, but make sure your u doesn't look like your v. My u's always have a foot on them, so my u I write with a foot, something like this, whereas my v just goes, I don't know, top to top, doesn't have that extra foot at the end. Uh, you may write your U like this, and your V has a really sharp point at the bottom. That's totally fine, too. But make sure your U is not equal to your V. Okay, so the process. Let's see. Here we go. All right. So it's going to go in steps. So step one. So your first vector. Oh, I use the opposite notation as the book. All right. I'm going to switch all my U's to V's. Or else, if I don't do that, I will almost guarantee make a big mistake later. So our original basis will be U's. Our new basis will be V's. So step one, your first vector is your first vector. So V1 is just U1 right there. Uh, we will normalize at the very end. So these won't be normal vectors until we get to the uh, very last step. All right, wouldn't it be nice if step two was v2 equals u2? So our v2 will not be u2. It'll be u2 minus u2 dot v1 divided by magnitude v1 squared times v1. So let's look at what I put in parentheses here. So I zoom way in. In the parentheses, when I take a dot product, do I get a number or a vector? Number. Number. What about magnitude? Number. Number. And number divided by number is a number, as long as your magnitude is not zero. How do I know that I'm not going to get zero in V1? Why would I not get? zero magnitude. W if I got zero magnitude, what would that vector v1 have to equal? Zero, zero, vector. zero vector. And we said it came from a basis. 
bases can have no zero vectors. So we will not be, if you're starting with the bases, you will not be divided by zero. All right, what you're looking at is also <coughs> called the projection right here. So you're actually going to project u2 onto v1. So what's in the parentheses is a scalar times a vector. So a scalar times a vector is a vector, and then you're going to be adding it to u2. So we'll get another vector right there. All right, now it gets a little uglier. Step three, v3 is u3 minus, so it's u3 dot v1 divided by magnitude v1 squared. Now that's almost the same as what's written above. What's the only difference? So it's basically that little subscript three right there. So unfortunately, you can't just grab the number you computed above and reuse it down here. So it's slightly different. But again, that's a scalar times v1. And then we also have to subtract u3 dot v2 divided by magnitude v2 squared times v2. So one thing you notice, or you could notice about the pattern is you're using, I'm just circling the subscripts right there. So the vector u that you use is u3 right here on all those spots. All right, step four. I want you to write what you think is the pattern. So what you think is the next. And I'll start you off with u4 minus. And there's going to be three things. So I want you to fill in what you think are the three things that go in here. And the pattern should be somewhat obvious. So my first coefficient is, of course, we're using u4, like I mentioned. And then the other subscripts are all 1s. So all the v subscripts are 1s times the vector v1. We move to the second one, still using u4, but now we're going to use, for vector v, it's all v2s. So it'll be u4 dot v2 divided by magnitude v2 squared v2. And our third. Still using u4, but now we're on to v3. Divided by v3 magnitude squared v3. <coughs> so this is where I'm going to write dot, 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 step n. And what step n will give us is vn. So I don't know how many things are in there, so I'm just going to just write dot, 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 meaning continue that pattern. So are there any questions on how this pattern works? I think it would be cruel to make you go past really four dimensions anyways, so I don't plan to give you a 12-dimensional, give me an orthogonal basis, because it would take an hour or two. There's a lot of dot products. So I think usually four is about, maybe there will be a homework question that goes five or six, but. I think that's too far on a quiz or a final exam at this point. All right, let's use this process to find a normal, oh, I didn't use, use the word normal. All right, these vectors are most likely not normal, so all we do to convert it to a, this will give us an orthogonal basis. So now our, 
we're using v's now v1 v2 vn is an orthogonal basis and you can normalize each vector to get a orthonormal basis. So our final basis will look like V1 divided by magnitude V1 comma V2 divided by magnitude V2 so that will be our orthonormal basis <coughs> alright so I'm going to write the uh, our original basis from our example question started out so easy So I'll use the uh, the span, the definition of the basis being the span of these two, one one zero and minus two zero one. So it's positive one one zero and then minus two zero one. All right, so there's our original basis right there. Did I write those two down right? I think it is. All right. So we have oops, these are u1, u2. So our v1 is u1, which is 1, 1, 0. So that one's always easy to get your first vector. Second vector, v2 is u2 minus, let's see if I, I think we did the, I want to write it in the correct order though, u2 minus u2 dot v1 divided by magnitude v1 squared times v1. minus 201 minus so we have u2 minus 201 dot v1 which is 110 divided by magnitude b1 squared times v1 The dot product negative two plus zero plus zero divided by that magnitude squared is going to be one squared plus one squared times one one zero. So we have negative two over one, which is negative one times one one zero. So we'll just be adding these coordinates. We'll do one more step. Can you spread the, the denominator? Oh. Yes, absolutely. Well, since it's the magnitude, would it be the square root of that? Oh no. Did I listen to you too quickly? Yeah, it'd be the square root squared. So, so you're squaring one squared plus one squared. So those are squared. The magnitude has a square root, and then the magnitude gets squared. Okay. 
So that's that's all the detail, yeah. Or you could think of it as a self dot product. Is another way. It's probably e in this situation is probably easier. Which the textbook I'm copying out of does magnitude squared, but I think a self dot product would be better. Um, all right. So our new basis we'll call B prime. All right, are they independent? Wouldn't it be the one, one, zero for first one? Oh, absolutely. All right, are these independent? Mm -hmm. They're not multiples, so they're independent. Dot product, you can take that real quick. Negative one plus one plus zero, our dot product is zero. So we got, they are orthogonal and they are a basis. They're not normalized, but it's pretty easy. You just divide them by their own magnitudes. So if we normalize, without going through all the steps, the magnitude of the first vector will be square root two, because one squared plus one squared is two, square root is two. So it's one over square root two, one over square root two, zero. The second vector has a magnitude of square root three. So it's negative one over square root three, positive one over square root three, and positive one over square root three. All right, so this is the algorithmic way to take a basis and get a normal uh, a basis that has the normal property. All right, so it's a good place to stop.